this week may be of of all the weeks in the people of God's, the community of faith in Nashville and Middle Tennessee, maybe the worst week ever. Um, You know, I think it was one of those weeks where I remember where I was when the space shuttle blew up. I was in seventh grade in Miss Ayer's class. I remember where I was when the towers were hit. And I think I'll always remember where I was when I got a text message this week about people dying. And um, it's awful. Um, You know, today I'm going to talk to you about what to do when, when tragedy strikes because the, the reality is we, we want to do something, we, we really do. And, 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 and the, first, the first thing I thought of, um, we're going to be going to John chapter 17, for those of you that have a Bible. If you want to turn there, we're going to be going there in a minute. But the first thing I thought of when I got that news this week I thought of certain scriptures, and, and, and I want to tell you something about as you talk with God. We, at Clearview, we, we've put a lot of emphasis on prayer, hearing from God, how to hear from God, how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. We do a lot at this church. Uh, typically in the summer, almost every year, I'll do a, a series on how to hear from God. That's part of that is even what we're doing in April with April intercession. I think that all Christians struggle with how to hear from God. And one of the things I can tell you, and in, in as you talk with God, you need to be honest about your emotions. Number one, he already knows. Number two, he's not threatened by it. All you have to do is look at the prophets and many of the things. It's amazing what, pro, what, what you're able to talk about and get away with it with God. Um, And the first thing I thought of was John chapter 14, verse 1, where Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Well, what if my heart is troubled, God? What if my heart is troubled? What if I am mad? You said, let not your heart be troubled. Well, you know what, God, it is troubled. We we know that even right here with Clearview Prep, the next day when parents were, were bringing their children here, they were leaving with tears in their eyes. When, when Isaiah says in Isaiah 41, 10, fear not for I am with you, be not dismayed for I am your God. Well, what if I am dismayed? What if I am afraid, right? What about when Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 12, he said, righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead my case with you. Nevertheless, I would discuss matters of justice with you. Why has the way of the wicked prospered? What an honest question. Why are all those who deal in treachery at ease? Boy, what a question. And and, and the first thing I want to do, especially as a man, is I want to fix things. I found myself this week when I was putting all this together I I want to take a wrench and turn a bolt and and repair something. I want want to to do something to repair something. And the reality is it's just evil. What do I do? It's a very helpless feeling, isn't it? I would think it is for me anyway. I was reminded of of how uh, I read an article many, many years ago. I can't remember where I read it, but but it was about pilots and and, and instrument panels. And and this is you know some of you have flown in here. And and uh, I read this article. Now I, I you have to forgive me. I, I'm, it's not like I know a lot about aviation, but in this article, this flight instructor was talking about as that one of the hardest things to do with young pilots is teach them to trust their instruments because it's counterintuitive sometimes. And, and, and this, this flight instructor said, you wouldn't believe the number of times and I have to let them explore it on their own. I can tell them, but sometimes it's just like you do with children. You need to let them feel the pain and the chaos. I think one of the worst things we can do as parents, Michelle and I made a decision long ago that we weren't going to shield our kids from pain. We, we, but now we, we, I don't know how well we've done with that at times, but we've tried to make sure that barring them, you know, literally cutting their legs off, we want them, we want them, because if, if you don't, they don't know how to deal with things later because they are going to face the hardships. 
And this instructor said, I had to learn to let pilots just let them, let them be. I could see them making mistakes. And he said, they would not trust their instruments. And a lot of times we would, I'd put them into clouds. And as they flow, flew into clouds, often we would come out of the clouds upside down. And he said, the whole time you were seeing that they couldn't trust their instruments. They had to learn. When you get in the fog, when you get in the, in the, in the reality of and things don't make sense and you're disoriented, trust your instruments. And, and, and I thought of that this very week. And, and what, I've, what I've had to learn, I, I learned this years ago. I don't know how I learned it. I don't, know, I, I, I don't think I read it in a book. I just learned over time that when I get confused and when I get disoriented and when things aren't really making sense, what I've had to do is go to the most simple facts of the situation. A lot of times drama and all these things are out there and all the, all the glitter in the periphery, but honestly, I ask myself all the time in pastoral situations, in, in situations of dysfunction, what is actually happening right here? I'm telling you, it's a great question to ask. What is actually happening? Not what everybody says is happening, what is actually happening? And what I've found in those situations is to, to trust your instruments. And what I would say to you today is trust the truth. Trust the truth. And here's why. Here's why we, we want to trust the truth. The truth is, is very important to us. We have two instruments of truth. We have a holy Bible illuminated by a holy spirit. We have God the Father, God the Son, and not God the Holy Bible. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives what we call in Christian circles illumination, puts a light onto things. And so we have a Bible, and that's why it's important for you to know the Bible and know the Scriptures. Because when you know, if you're biblically illiterate, and most of the Christian community is, honestly, across America, biblically we, we face more biblical illiteracy than we've ever faced in the history of the church, in my opinion. And, and that's why we have so much dysfunction within. And, and, and the reality is we don't know our instruments. And if we know our instruments, it gives us the ability to navigate in the fog. And so today, Jesus said this in, in John chapter 17. Now, he's praying for the disciples. He's praying for the disciples in John 17, verse 13. And this is what he says. He says, but now I came. He's talking to the Lord, but he's talking about us. So we might want to pay attention. And he said, now I come to you, Lord God, Father, that these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world. See, you got to understand something. I think that's a key element to how to pray under pain. Jesus was under intense scrutiny. The disciples were under intense scrutiny. And the way Americans pray is we always pray for relief. Most of the time when we're pressed, I don't even think that's just an American thing. I think that's a human thing. We just want it off of us. Jesus didn't pray for that. He didn't say take them out of the world. He said keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even those I'm not of the world, verse 16. Here we go, verse 17. Sanctify them. What does sanctify mean? It, it's an old word. You don't hear it a whole lot, um, except in churches. But sanctify simply means set apart. It just means set them apart, okay? Sanctification is the middle ground. I was justified when I came to Jesus, meaning he made my sins right. I'm forgiven forever when I came to Jesus. I'm justified there. In heaven, I'll be what's called glorified, meaning I'll be made fully perfect. But from the moment that I got saved over here to the time I see Jesus over there, in that middle ground, as I like to call it, in the middle ground, that's the setting apart ground. And so he says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. That's the instrument. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I sanctify myself that they themselves may also be sanctified in what? The truth. You see, trust the truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, for those who, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they would be one, even as you and I are one, and you are in me and I'm in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, our unity is a, is a marketing message to the world. Our unity, and that's why, unhar and I'm going to take a 
Time out. I'm going to take an aside. I'm going to take 30 seconds. That's why churches that are always divided and yak, 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 yak. And you know what that does? All it does is tell the whole world they don't have it together. Why should I want to join their untogetherness? Right? Why should I be a part of that? They're just chewing each other up. Right? So unity matters, but we're not going to deal with that today. We're going to deal with what Jesus had to say about sanctifying. See, I've got to trust the truth. Now, why would I want to trust the truth? Here's why. Here's why. You ready for this? You writing this down? God gave me truth because truth is immune to circumstance. Truth is immune to circumstance. You're, you're, re, re, regardless of what happens to you, you can find, that's why I told you before, what's actually happening here? Because when you can get to the truth of the matter, when you can actually find out what's happening, then, then you can go. See, I think so often in our own lives, we treat symptoms, we go after symptoms, we, we talk about symptoms, we want all, uh, really what's ended up happening, if we can go after the root, what do keys to freedom always teach us? Why don't we teach that at Clearview all the time? Go to the root, because the root determines the fruit, Amen. The root determines the fruit. Go after the root. If you go after the root, the fruit tends to take care of itself, right? So, a lot to say that I want to say about that, but I'm not going to this morning. So, what is the truth then? Because I found myself this week, I mean, I literally fought, delete, type, 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 delete, type, delete. Tight, delete whole sections, delete. Because you want to fix it. Because you're mad. I don't know anybody that doesn't know somebody that hasn't been touched by this tragedy. I was with people this week that knew people that are now in heaven. And it's awful. This is a community thing. It's not just a church that has experienced a tragedy. We, we don't always deal with, you know, when a church has a tragedy. This is a whole bunch of churches and a whole bunch of people and a whole community of faith that is hurting today. So we're going to trust the truth. We're going to go back to the simplicity of the truth. And I've got a few for you this morning. Here's the first truth. Ready? Sin destroys. That's the reality. Sin destroys. That's what it's meant to do. That's the reality of sin. Paul said, I was thinking about Romans 6 this week in my mind. And in in Romans 6, it says this. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages, the cost, the payment for sin is death. Now, now you can look at that word in the context of of how it reads in the original languages. But I will tell you, um, when Paul in Romans 6 uses the word death, there's a couple times. See, one of the things about the English language is we, um, I speak a little Romanian. You know, um, I mean, my grammar is really bad. I can't, I don't even, you know your Romanian's bad when the translators are translating your Romanian. And, and, but they get most of it. They like that I try. Um, in the English language, we use one word can mean all kinds of things like cool. Cool can mean all kinds of stuff, Right? Over there, they have specific words for cool to the touch, cool outside. It's incredibly specific. Greek's the same way. And so Paul uses different words for death. And that word death right there really is meaning in its widest sense. What that word death means right there is that in the widest sense, death represents all the miseries that come from separation from God. It's like the the most broad net that you could cast right? Sometimes we have words that mean very specific things. This word death means in the, it means literally in the broadest sense, it's death of anything and everything that rises from the ground up from separation from God. So the, the, the the cost of sin is death. Sin seeks to destroy And we live in a blame culture and everybody wants to blame something all the time. It's just who we are. 
We just, we want to find somebody to penalize it on. We, we're a very litigious society, so we want to litigate all the things. Or we just want to have, a lot of times it's not just we want to litigate. We just want, we need, we, all of us as humans, we, we, we have this thing, we, have, we need a mental hook. We, we need a place to put it. Right? We need to, we need to go, oh yeah, I, my car broke down because, you know, the transmission failed. I need a place to, I need to under, the worst thing you want to hear from a, from a mechanic is I don't really know what's going on. No, you, 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 when you go to a doctor, you don't want to hear, ah, you know, you don't want to hear the term exploratory surgery. You want to hear things like, you know, th- this is what's wrong with your liver, Right? We, we, want to, we want to blame things. And I'm telling you, friends, if you want to blame something, blame evil. Don't blame a gun. I'm going to speak some truth to you. Don't blame a gun. You know, I can buy a hammer and build you an awesome house. I can buy a hammer and destroy your car. Don't blame any object that a human uses on anything. And while I'm saying it to you, Christian friends, you ready for this? Don't blame the homosexual community either. Because there's a lot of people. We've taken some very firm stances. No, wait, wait, we haven't. We've taken biblical stances at this church about homosexuality. We're not going to back up from that one bit. But this has nothing to do with gay or straight. This has nothing to do with transgender. It has everything to do with evil. If you want to blame something, blame the devil. Let's put the blame where the blame's at. Because that's what's actually happening. And that's why the gospel is so important. Because you want to cure that, you can't do it, you can't do it with a law. Because that person walked right through a whole bunch of laws. Since when has the law against rape ever stopped a rapist? We outlawed cocaine trafficking years ago. Last I checked, it's still coming across the borders. We've outlawed DUI long ago. It's still affecting and people are dying from DUI accidents. All, let's don't, there is no law that can be created to mitigate evil Amen. if people want to do it. John F. Kennedy even said one time, it's easy to kill the president. All you have to do is be willing to trade your life for his. Let's put blame where blame is at. That's why the gospel matters. And that's why you matter. Because us sharing the gospel goes after the root. And if you can change hearts, if the Lord, the Lord can change hearts. The Bible says he can turn the hearts of kings. The Lord can do anything That's why the gospel matters, because sin destroys. But there's another truth I want to remind you of this morning, and it's this, is that justice will be done. But I want you to be careful before you try to define justice, okay? Justice will be done. I thought of what David said when I was putting this together. Man, you know, I think the reason that we all identify so much, or at least David, the Psalms make so much sense to us, you know, is because David, God was very clear about how he felt about David. What what gives me so much hope about David is that God can say, that's a man after my own heart. But David was no saint. And God knew it. David's a man, he said, he's a man after my own heart. So David asked the question in the Psalms, how long will my enemy triumph over me? How long? How long will my enemy triumph over me? What an honest question. How long, God? How long will this happen? How long will I have to sit there and watch while they mock you? If you don't believe that, read Psalm, I think it's 139, where, where, where David says, I hate your enemies. I have nothing but hatred for your enemies. I want them all dead because they mock you. I love David's honesty. How, how long, how long will the enemy triumph over me? 
I was reminded of Romans 12 this week. Romans 12, 9 says this, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. Justice will be done. Jesus told us that we would be sanctified by the truth. Well, that's a truth. Jesus prayed, your word is truth. And that's why I'm giving you so many scriptures this morning because it's the, the truth is the instrument. The truth is the constant. Trust the truth in the fog. And what we want to take revenge, but we don't, on what? What do we want to take revenge on? I mean, there, there's a lot of things, right? But here's the thing about Justice, justice is different from vengeance in God's economy, right? In God's economy, it's different. Justice is different. Justice for God, listen, I'm just speaking about God's attributes. Justice is different because God doesn't offer justice to take revenge. Did you hear me? God doesn't offer justice to take revenge. You know why? He, he's not incomplete. People that want to take revenge, they've had something taken from them. People that want revenge often have, had, they've been robbed, they've been pulled, they've, they've been ripped off. You ever felt ripped off? That's why we get mad. We've been violated. God is fully complete within himself. He lacks nothing and he's in need of nothing. Therefore, he doesn't need to repair anything that he has lost in and of himself. God's sense of justice for him, it's not revenge because he's not lacking anything. Let me tell you what justice is about with God. It's about restoration. It's about restoration. And restoration is different from revenge. Revenge is an eye for an eye, right? You hit me, I'm going to hit you. I used to box. I had a very small and illustrious, non-illustrious career in boxing. Um, And, but I I did learn a few key truths. One of those truths that I I got to spar um, once with a guy who went to, he was quite a bit older than us and he would just let us hit on him and, and, uh, he was like 18, we were like 14 and he would just let us hit on him. And, and he, he actually, he, he, uh, the top three in America went to the Olympics and he was number four. So he was the backup in case one of them got hurt. So got to spar with that guy. I don't remember much about it, but, um, (laughs) but they taught us if he hits you once, you hit him twice. If he hits you twice, you hit him three times, right? And that's not what God is doing when, when we're wanting to pay back. I'm thinking of, of Gar, I, I, we all know how Jason feels about yard work, and, but the, the, the reality is, this is what I've learned from some of you that like that, is that that one of the things I've learned about people that love landscaping is they hate weeds. And they hate weeds because it's not that they just hate the weeds. Stay with me now. It's not that they just hate weeds, that the weed has no place in the garden. It's not supposed to be there. And so they take it out. Because everything they did and all they planted and all they worked for, a weed has no place there. You see, the the reality is that God brings justice to restore. You know why? Because evil isn't loving and God is love. The Bible says God is love and evil's not loving. So he's going to restore that through justice. He's he's going to wipe that that out. God is life and there's nothing life giving about evil. So he's going to restore that. And that's what justice looks like. Justice is about restoration. That's why I think in the end, in the resurrection, you see a bodily resurrection, right? Because the body was broken by the power of sin. That's why we're all getting older. Seriously, I mean, no kidding. It's why, why we ache. It's why we hurt. But Paul even uses phrases about Jesus that birth pangs. He talks about that it's an aching in the inside. As we get older, our bodies show the effects of sin. Why? Because sin, sin destroys everything it touches. 
everything it touches. So God's going to restore all that, and he's going to make it right again. So justice is coming, which tells me that there's something to look forward to, friends, because peace is coming. And that's another truth that I want to remind you of this morning. Peace is coming. Sin destroys, justice will be done, but peace is coming. I want you to turn in your Bible to the very last book of the Bible called Revelation, chapter 20. And we're going to read, remember, we've got to trust the truth. Jesus said, sanctify them. God, I gave them your word, and your word is truth. That's why I started in John 17 this morning. Jesus said, I'm not taking them out. When, let me th- as you're turning to Revelation 20, think about this. When Jesus spoke those words to sanctify them in truth, do you think Jesus was tone deaf to what was happening? No, he was about to go to the cross. Do you think Jesus was tone deaf about about the fact that Paul would have his head cut off for the gospel? Do you think he was tone deaf that the apostles would be martyred? Do you think he somehow forgot in in, in all of God's omnipotence and all knowing and all presence, do you think that somehow he forgot that there was coming a day? For 2,000 years, Christians have been martyred. For 2,000 years. So he said, don't take them out of the world. I send them into that world. I send them into that world. And that's the truth. So he says, I want you to know the truth. The truth is that peace is coming. And I want you to start in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. This is what is often referred to as the great white throne judgment. So let me give you a little bit of quick context. And I am using, if this were a painting, an exercise in painting a wall, I'm not using a three-inch brush and I'm not even using a roller. I, I'm, I'm, using, I'm using a spray gun that they haven't created yet. I'm giving you broad context on the broadest level, but here's the broad context. We're at the end of time as we know it, chronos time. We're at the end of chronos time, all right? Verse 11, Revelation 20, and then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell gave up the dead which were in them and they were all judged, each one of them, according to their deeds." And then death itself and hell itself were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the fire. Let's continue. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. These things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, right for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega. That means the the first and the last. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. 
He who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. I want you to look in Revelation 22, verse 1. And then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there will no longer be any curse... And the throne of God of, and, and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. He's talking about all of us. And there will no longer be any night, and they will have no need of the light of a lamp or even the light of a sun because the Lord God will illuminate them. And they will reign forever and ever. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we believe it. Back in the days of the Old Testament, when things got really hard, Hebrews were known to say, flee to the day of the Lord. And what that means, it was a mental thing. It was meant so that the Old Testament Hebrew would remember this isn't home. This isn't home. We're not home yet. It's not supposed to look like home. It's not supposed to feel like home. We're not home yet. Flee to the day of the Lord. A day when every crooked place will be made straight, every right will be made right, every wrong will be corrected, every broken thing restored. And so we say with John, even so, come Lord Jesus. You know, it means a lot to us that you would come here today and be a part of who we are. It, it really does matter to us more than you might realize. Sometimes I think we underestimate the power we have to influence people. You know, if you would look around your world, you'd be amazed at how many people would receive what you have to say to them. You could be a digital missionary. You don't have to post everything on Facebook or we're not asking you to go on your favorite social platform, but I would challenge you to look around your world I guarantee you might have a friend, even in a different state or another part of the world, something was said today, whether a sermon, a prayer, a song, something was said that could mean a lot to them, man, send it to them. You'd be amazed at how much of a difference that could make.